Rishi Sunak pledged in January last year to reduce NHS waiting lists. Well, every month since then, they've gotten longer. And in no place is that more acute than where I am right now, South End. It's estimated some 20% of the people that live here are waiting for surgery. You could take any five random people, chances are one of them would be waiting for something. I want to understand why that's happening, but most importantly, what it means for people here in their day-to-day -day lives. Welcome to a town with a sickness. Oh. How long have you lived in Southend? All my life. Since I was 18. I'm born and raised here in Southend. I've um, been here all my life. My name's Chris Langdon and uh, I'm an historian and local historian based, uh, based in Southend on Sea in Essex. I do local talks and tours. Um, I like to share the local history of the area. It's, it's a passion um, and uh, I, I like to share that with people. And I think that we should all be a little bit proud of where we come from and, and where we live. Southend until recently didn't exist. Um, it was something of a geographic expression in as much as it was the south end of Prittlewell. Um, however, by the mid-1700s, we find a small collection of fishermen's cottages um, farther along on the beach, a couple of hundred yards from where we are. And they were facilitating uh, small-scale oyster farming um, as well as fishing on a local level. So from that point, we then find a massive population surge. My understanding is that at present, the population is about 185,000. Um, and bearing in mind that uh, the better part of two centuries ago, there were 1,500 people in what was called Old South End down the street, uh, that's, quite, that's quite an increase. The, 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 the town is really defined by its modernity in some aspects. During the Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars, you have an extended period where going abroad was off, off the table. Um, and as a consequence, a domestic tourism trade emerged and a whole host of sort of seaside and coastal towns developed as tourist towns really, or spa towns, uh, where you come to take the air, take the water. Uh, it was part of um, health and wellbeing, I suppose, as we call it today. Particularly if you're living in London, you know, by the, um, the earlier and middle decades of the 19th century, you see rapid urbanisation, industrialisation. So you're looking at uh, densely populated parts of the city where people are living in very, very bad conditions, to put it politely. Um, so a consequence of that was for people to be prescribed visits to the seaside. Uh, not just South End, of course, any coastal town, uh, you know, um, in relation to where you're living. Having fresh water, uh, taking in the fresh air, was supposed to be good for the heart and for the lungs and the body at large. In the decades that followed, um, sort of 1945, that tourism industry did sort of peter out um, bit by bit by bit. Um, although we do still have day trippers coming in from the city, not as many as we used to. Like I say, we're not looking at nearly 100,000 people coming a day. We might get that over the course of a week, you know, or a weekend perhaps. Um, so I think that there's an idea of how does South End identify in the 21st century. We've got a densely populated area. Um, we've got, um, you know, very old roads um, and equally uh, I think this was about 2017, there was an article that went out that said that we had one of the high, highest prices of properties and lowest average incomes because um, a lot of people who live and work in this area don't necessarily get a very good wage. Um, people who work in the city might do, um, I don't know, I don't work in the city, but uh, you know, that's definitely a struggle on the, the local economy and also for local people. It's really interesting uh, speaking to Chris then and the idea that infrastructure in Southend hasn't been able to keep up with the rapidly expanding population, not least in the case of these two railway lines that were built to South End to bring people from London here, uh, as mentioned, to sort of take the water, take the air behind me for health reasons. Well, it's very different now. Those railway lines, I saw them this morning, take people out of South End and into London, commuters. This place is a commuter town now and almost it's created two separate classes of people in the city. If you wanted to be Dickensian about it, it's a tale of two cities. There's the commuter class on higher wages, homeowners who travel into London every day for work. And then there's the locals who stay and work here, often on a minimum wage. And I think actually that pertains to the most interesting thing that Chris said, which was about identity. And actually the fact that South End is struggling to find its identity and find its place in the modern world. What's causing South End's waiting lists? Like most of Britain, 
the population of Southend is aging and has all the ailments that that brings. This pressure is compounded by higher than average levels of deprivation. In Southend, more than 20% of children are living in poverty. Deprivation and poor health outcomes are inextricably linked, with children in the city's most deprived ward expected to live nine years fewer than their peers in the best off. And, well, then there's COVID, the backlog and fallout of which has extended the waiting list of hospitals throughout the country. At last check, Southend University Hospital was told it requires improvement by the Care Quality Commission. And staff vacancies aren't being filled. A salary increase of 10% for doctors based in London is an ever-present pull factor. Last year, staff frustrations over working conditions and pay erupted into a nationwide series of strikes. Dr. Fia Muratib, a junior doctor in the Mid and South Essex Trust, spoke to me about the pressures on the NHS in the region. And you're asking why that's the case. So I feel like um, over the past 15 years, um, the NHS, it's been grossly mismanaged. Um, it's been underfunded. And along with underfunding comes, uh, you know, pay erosion to staff salary. And uh, I can only speak for doctors, but we've uh, suffered a big pay erosion. I think one of the one of the biggest pay erosions out of all the staff um, in the NHS. So, um, and that's over the past 15 years. And um, when, what do you need to bring waiting lists down? You need staff. And how do you keep staff? You need to pay them. And you need to pay them something that they're happy with as well. Um, so I think at the moment, doctors, they don't feel like uh, they're being valued by the government and they're all leaving in droves. And um, I imagine that's why the waiting lists are so long. You, you'd probably see this reflected in a lot of uh, trusts across the country. It's a, it's the, the NHS is a monopsony at the end of the day. So you, you'll see it's reflected across very similarly across all the trusts. But it's the same idea that we, we have an aging population. Um, we have a growing population, and with the aging po population, you have more complex um, diseases, more comorbidities, people are getting more sick, and um, the problem is that we don't have enough doctors to tend to that many sick people. Um, and the reason, again, why we don't have enough doctors is um, I feel like there are many doctors, they either leave the country or they change industries. Um, they just don't feel like they're being valued enough. And um, I, I would say that's the reason why we'd have, uh, we're having such long waiting lists, really, especially around here. And a war of words has erupted over the actual extent of the waiting list in Southend. While the Times and Telegraph assert the number is about 20% of the population, based on a calculation of 41,000 surgeries of a population of 181,000, the hospital says the number is closer to one in seven, and the national average, when you include patients from all three of the local authorities, which Southend Hospital also covers. Matthew Hopkins, Chief Executive at Mid and South Essex NHS Foundation Trust said, Southend is broadly in the same position as the rest of the country in terms of waiting times. Southend University Hospital is part of Mid and South Essex NHS Foundation Trust, one of the largest trusts in the country, with over 1.2 million in our catchment population, covering the towns and cities of Chelmsford, Southend and Basildon. The vast majority of people waiting for treatment are waiting for outpatient appointments, not surgery. Waiting for any treatment or surgery is always difficult, and we're sorry that some people have had to wait longer than we want them to. We are providing more diagnostic hubs and increasing our surgical capacity so we can treat our patients as quickly as we can, with the aim of having no patients waiting beyond 65 weeks this year. We are making substantial progress to reduce waiting times to 52 weeks along with the rest of England. Jackie, how long have you lived in South Hempel? Uh, I've been here since I was 18. Okay. Not too long then? No, I'm 50. <laughs> no, look it. <laughs> Tell me about South End. What's it like living in? Um, I love it. Same as any other big seaside town. It was nicer when I was young, but it's a bit dead now, really. Pubs all right. Food's all right. Nice. People all right. Yeah. 
Yeah, the people are fine. Yeah, people are fine. Don't be too, he don't be too heavy on the brace for them there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I only come here for college, but I just feel welcomed anyway. Living around here, though, is not, I wouldn't say the best. I'm on the policing course to, like, oh, yeah. yeah, to help out people around. And my dad's, like, also one as well. And I want to help people, like, because I didn't get much help in Tilbury. So I just want to prove my point and say, even though I'm from, like, a crappy area, I'm not, like, swear, am I? Okay. Uh, it's going to be beeped. <laughs> no, it's fine, mate. You can swear, don't you? Oh, well, I'm from a crappy area anyway. And so I want to prove to people, even though I'm from a crappy area again it's just i can prove myself to people do you know anyone that's waiting to, waiting to get surgery or anything like that have you had an experience at the hospital my wife's been waiting for over two years to have surgery on her knee no way yeah so um yeah she's in quite a lot of pain with it now having the job to get up the stairs just waiting but there these people with worse things than like a knee up. I know when I've gone for work and I've had to take like from a care home, mm. um, you've waited a long, long time mm. in the waiting area, not even not even actually in A and E, but out in the ambulances you're waiting. Then you go into like you're waiting ages in triage, mm. but they I think it was worse when we had the COVID and I think the appointments they're just trying to catch up. Obviously it affects your life if you can't walk or you can't walk far so I feel she should have got it earlier but nothing you can really do about it you, you just got to put up and wait as, as I say there's always people in worse positions and waiting for worse operations it is what it is yeah nothing you can do about it elderly people operations hip 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 replacement stuff like that people waiting for a long time or um depends if you've got money doesn't it <laughs> kind of an abstract question but about what it means to be from South End, if you could kind of talk a little bit about the identity of the place and the character of the people here. Um, the identity of the place, I, I, I don't know if it really has got much identity. Getting a bit run down now. I mean, they're starting to like do regeneration on the, uh, the seafront. I think that's the only reason people are going to want to come to South End to come to the seafront. Steve, thanks for your time, mate. No problem. Really appreciate you stopping to talk to us. Man. No problem. Have a great day. Thanks. That last question is one which fascinates me. What does it mean to be from South End? The identity of the place. So, I'm going to meet an artist who's got a few ideas on the matter. Hi, I'm Lou. I'm a visual artist based in South End on Sea. And yeah, I make art, I do public arts commissions, and then a lot of workshops, community projects, um, yeah, collaborations. And who's sat next to you? This is Polly. She's officially my assistant's dog, but she's off duty today, so she's allowed to snooze. Um, but as you can tell, she does like to be in the limelight. Where are we right now? Uh, so I'm at the Old Waterworks, which is an artist-run charity. We have 14 artists using it as studios. I love South End. I'm a big South End representative. A lot of the work I do is about this place and South End's history. The community is very resilient. People have a DIY attitude. You can see that from the kind of music scene in South End as well. People love putting on gigs, putting on their own events. And that's the kind of energy that I love about South End. We're not London, we're outside London. We've got our own personality. I am like a big fan of South End, but I saw that Times article and it said one in five, I think, people are on the waiting list. A lot of us are on two waiting lists. And I kind of laughed because I was like, yeah, I'm literally on two waiting <laughs> lists. And like most of my friends are on at least one. Mm. So yeah, that kind of rang true immediately. The council and South End um, Hospital have come out and said it's one in eight, but I mean, it's still massive. Yeah. It's still not ideal, is it? It's not as bad as that, but it is still yeah, quite bad. It's still pretty bad. Um, <laughs> I'm on the waiting list for Asperger's, which it's actually changed diagnosis names. It's now the or, um, ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. And that's actually changed since I've been on the waiting list. So that's been about nearly six years. You've been on, on the that. waiting list for so long that yeah. they've changed the name of the thing that you're waiting to be diagnosed yeah. for. <laughs> on the condition, yeah. <laughs> 
So that's that. Yeah. Um, I have emailed them several times like, hey, what's going on? Have you forgotten about me? And they did write a letter saying, we haven't forgotten about you. Like the um, letter literally says that. So that I've just put on the back burner of my brain. I've just accepted that that might be a thing. C can we focus on that for a second? Yeah. What does it feel like to... Because your health and your and yeah. also possibly you know with a, a diagnosis like that that pertains yeah. actually quite directly to your identity and sense of self. Yeah. yeah. And just saying, oh, I've put that on the back burner. Mm. How like, what does that feel like? Yeah, it feels like a massive part of my identity and things that could actually help me and accessing these resources is just like not available mm. to me until I have a proper diagnosis when it's all about your identity and how you function on a daily basis it does feel like you're in limbo really and you're kind of not sure if you can say you do have it to access things but also if you don't then are you denying that part of yourself yeah. the other thing I'm waiting for also on the back burner of my brain I've had to like compartmentalize it is um, I was feeling really unwell. I went to the doctors and they gave me all the blood tests. They gave me an ECG and they said, uh, the doctor rang me up and was like, oh, I think you might have AFib. And I was like, what's that? Um, arterial fibrillation, with, which is a heart issue. So immediately quite scary. There must be some kind of psychological toll there for yeah. being, you know, whether it's manifests as anxiety and stress about yeah, your heart, definitely. whether, you know, being able to fully define or, or I fully come to grips with your identity because there's this possible condition you could be diagnosed with that could change that. Yeah, and then you're also thinking in the back of your head, do I do this activity? Am I not allowed to do this activity because I might have a heart issue? Mm. Or do I change my diet? Do I change my fitness? Um, and also knowing that your heart is quite a major, <laughs> it's quite a major yeah, yeah, organ. Yeah, I'd probably say so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that you probably want to know if there's something wrong with it. Um, to also have these two diagnoses, which may or may not be true, and then to also just, like, not hear from the hospital is really worrying. And, yeah, you're right, I spend a lot of my time just anxious about it in this kind of heightened state of anxiety, mm. which, if you do have a heart condition, isn't great yeah. to be, um, yeah, stressing yourself. Out over that. You know, we have to mention um, the junior doctor's strikes as well. Yeah. This. You know, we've just come off the back of mm. the most extensive strike in their history, six days. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's extending the waiting list. Does it change whether or not yeah. your potentially how you feel about them, your support for them? I don't know if six days is going to make much of a difference compared to my six year wait. I think even as an artist, I probably earn more than a lot of NHS staff. Mm. Um, so it's not really a great career. Like you wouldn't want to go in, in, into that. If they agreed a settlement, they'd stop striking and more people would be inclined to want to work for the NHS because the, it pays better. Mm. Yeah. And resolve the staffing issues. Yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> would be nice, wouldn't it? I love that she's just licking her ass. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't care that she's on camera. Oh, bam. <laughs> <laughs> love that for you, Cole. Great work. Great work. Well done, girl. Well done, girl. You're distracting me, dog. <laughs> Life in modern Britain is hard, or is getting harder. And in a way, South End represents that change. The place that the Victorians were once prescribed to attend to take in the sea air and the water is now struggling to access modern medicine to which the population is entitled. The degradation of our social fabric from the concrete of NHS funding and healthcare access to the more abstract sense of community, home, place is ubiquitous. And being here and spending time with people, you get the sense that renewal means a whole lot more than increasing NHS funding or reform. It means reclaiming identity, reconnecting people with each other and rediscovering something long since lost here and across the country. Pride.